could do meals for a week. Oh, an apple and an orange. Yeah. Uh, it was, yeah, my wife has one much more elaborate. It's like wood. She even had wood for all the keycaps, so it really looks like it was carved out of the tree. This is insane. Um, if, if you go to the share thing, share slides, there's a, okay. if you go to the shared, yeah. Yeah, I thought there was a way on that thing to resync it. Uh, it's somewhere else because I know they, you can manually. Yeah.
We'll get started in a minute. Just come in and get your lunch and sit down. Yeah, I just didn't, I wanted your slides. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, if we could um, quiet down a tiny bit. Hello? Okay, folks, time to start the meeting. It'll be pretty brief, so you can chat at the end. How's that? <laughs> okay. 
Uh, so welcome to the Working Group Chairs Forum at IETF 115. Um, as you all are well aware, this is an official IETF meeting and here's the uh, note well. Um, if folks could contribute to notes on the uh, notes page, that would be fantastic. I haven't specifically requested a scribe, so that would be great. Um, we have a super short agenda. Oh wait, oops, sorry, I skipped this one. Uh, here's just some general notes. Uh, draft minutes are in the online tool. Please contribute and ensure accuracy and completeness. Use the Q tool, uh, be clear, concise, and respectful, and please act according to the IETF code of conduct. Um, so the agenda is very short today. Um, I sent out, uh, you might've seen an email I sent yesterday. Uh, if this had been like a regular working group meeting and we got to like a week or two before the IETF, um, we might have canceled this session because we didn't have any real strong agenda items, but uh, since lunch is being served, um, we did not do that. So uh, we have an opportunity for uh, a fair amount of open mic and uh, AOB at the end, uh, but we have only one solid agenda item for today. Uh, and with that, uh, Greg, do you want to come? Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Greg Wood. I'm with the ITF Administration LLC. Oh, it's already up. And I wanted to just give a little update on the chairs training that we've done um, in the last few weeks. Uh, just as background in case folks are new or um, maybe haven't caught it, uh, we started um, online chairs training uh, three years ago now. So this is sort of our third edition. Uh, and the goal of the training is to provide chairs with uh, a set of skills they can use in managing um, their groups, uh, either working groups or research groups. And so we've developed a curriculum over the last three years, sort of evolved it and improved it based on experience uh, to cover um, contribution, uh, dealing with co promoting contribution, uh, dealing with co resolving conflict and then uh, reaching consensus. So generally, uh, you know, hitting the, not the detail level how to process parts of uh, how a group works, but sort of the high, higher level, how, how to um, encourage participants to work effectively together uh, as a chair. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen now is the uh, high-level dashboard from the, um, the training sessions we held this year. And they, the three classes had two, two sessions each uh, to accommodate time zones. And after each class, we asked participants to complete a short, short survey, uh, I think four questions, uh, to rate various aspects uh, the, of, the, of the class. I will say just as a top level, the um, feedback we got from this uh, latest edition of the of the training was the best that we've ever had. Um, and so I find that really encouraging. Uh, we, As you can see, we use this uh, metric called Net Promoter Score, which is basically how likely would you be to recommend this uh, to your friends uh, or, or to your colleagues. And um, you, you know, there's some detail about how it's calculated, but basically anything over 50 is considered very, very good. Uh, so you can see that we uh, are very, very positive overall. 73 is, a, is an excellent result. <clears throat> um, and you can see that we uh, have overall and we have it by cohort because, the, uh, as you'll see on the next slide, the um, composition of the two sessions was a little bit different. And so we wanted to count for that. Um, yeah, thanks. Next slide. So while the, while the uh, feedback we got from... Uh, Oh, there was just one other note on the feedback that I, if I could go back to the slide. Uh, this gives the sort of the raw number score, uh, but we also had qualitative feedback. And one of the main points about the qualitative feedback I'd like to share with this group is that uh, the, the sessions were designed to be very, very uh, interactive. So it wasn't just people, uh, you know, like an instructor presenting material. Uh, it was structured so that the material set up conversations among the participants. And one of the one of the areas that we got the best uh, or the most positive feedback about was 
the conversations that resulted um, and uh, the, uh, that dynamic, like being able to talk to each other about their experiences and what worked and didn't work for them in various aspects was a very, very positive uh, uh, part of the training and something that uh, we might look at taking forward in other, uh, other uh, ways. So not just within formal training, but somehow to create opportunities for that kind of uh, conversations going forward. Uh, yeah, Barry, please. Barry Leva, do you have any sense of why there's such a great difference between the two times? In the, uh, the uh, no, I haven't looked into that. I, it, yeah, and, I, and the thing I'll say is that uh, the, the training um, wrapped up uh, two weeks ago, and between sort of finishing that off and getting ready for this meeting, we haven't looked at diving into the, haven't had a chance to dive into the data or, or feedback, but that's definitely something that um, we'll look at as well as some other whether, uh, other aspects. The, the final thing I want to say about this edition of the training is different from previous editions, is that we explicitly opened it up to people who weren't uh, yet chairs maybe, or maybe were chair curious. So uh, folks who would maybe consider being chairs, uh, but, and, but hadn't yet actually had the opportunity to be a chair, um, and the idea there is that uh, the, um, the goal is to provide uh, a sort of a little sneak preview into people, uh, for people, uh, what chairing entails and what it's about, uh, and maybe increase their comfort level with being, uh, for being considered as a chair. Um, yeah, so uh, sort, sort of grow the pool of potential chairs, uh, people who would be interested in doing that. Uh, thanks, next slide. And I'm happy to take questions as, as it goes on. I can't see the cue, so please please interrupt if something comes up. Uh, so this these charts are very high level, uh, and this is, goes to Barry's point uh, a little bit, uh, is that the participation uh, was also different between the sessions. So on the left graph, you'll see that these are the registrations. Uh, so people who actually signed up for the sessions, and on the right is the uh, people who, uh, number of people who showed up for each session. So you can see there's quite a bit of difference. We need to explore uh, why that was. In addition to the uh, different satisfaction ratings, you can see the, the numbers between the two sessions were different. Uh, I mean, the, the main difference between the sessions were uh, time zones. So that might be the, the trick, is the, the earlier session covered sort of work was convenient and easy for sort of East Coast and um, uh, Europe. Uh, and the later session was more convenient for West Coast and, and other uh, geographies further west. Uh, so that's definitely something that we're going to look into is uh, why the difference. But uh, I will say the main uh, question that I have and need to look into is why didn't we get more uh, people showing interest in this and maybe participating? Um, so there are a number of questions we'd like to ask, uh, for example, of the people who registered but then didn't show up. I'd uh, like to, would love to have feedback from anybody in this room or uh, online uh, about if you were, you know, had some idea of being interested in the training, but then didn't actually sign up. It'd be great to know uh, why that was. Um, and any suggestions for how we can actually encourage people to participate in this kind of training uh, would be also also super welcome. Um, the last thing I'll do here, uh, I don't see anybody running to the queue, is to make a plug for the on-demand versions of this training. So if you were interested in um, this, these topics, uh, even if you've been running a, 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 a um, group for a long time, uh, but you don't want to brush up on the skills or just maybe get some new thinking, uh, we have on-demand uh, versions of the training, which in, after the session, I'll send a, a link around with the summary of this and a uh, link to the on-demand versions as well uh, to the working group chairs list. Pete. Hi, it's Pete. Um, hey, Pete. So I went to one of these sessions, um, which was fabulous. And I'm not saying that just because some of it was on the consensus stuff that I've written and they turned it, the, the crap that I've written about into something that's actually useful. Um, but I, I think a couple of things. I think ADs and chairs should attend these things just so they get their head around stuff in a form that they can actually 
present to new folks. Um, some of this is just structured really nicely. The other thing I would say is even if you're an experienced chair and you're completely wonderful and know all this stuff and you have great experience and don't need any of this information, showing up for these sessions to participate in the discussion with other people so that you can grant your wonderful wisdom to them is still valuable. Side note, you'll probably learn something anyway, shock of all shocks. But um, I know ADs don't have a tremendous amount of time, none of us do, but show up for these things and give your chairs a kick to go do it. it it's very worth it. Um, and you guys have done a really good job on, on the material. Um, it was really well presented. Thank, thanks, Pete. Um, did you want to say something, Aaron? Bron. Ah, Bron, okay, yeah. Duck down for this thing. I didn't do this round, I did a previous time. I'm involved in other things. I teach gym classes for them. I'm required to have first aid certificate every year updated. I'm also required to do ongoing education. Um, I think that's important for everyone to reflect on the fact that your skills do need to keep being updated, and particularly if you've been chairing for a long time, it's easy to fall into a rut. These, these are really valuable sessions. I wish I'd had the chance to get to it this time as well. I will join it again when it happens next time. And likewise, I found the conversations when I did it really valuable. And talking with other chairs in a situation where you're not just running the session will help you be a better chair. Thanks, thanks Brian. Hi, Dhruv here. Uh, just to uh, add to Braun, one thing which also was very useful, usually sometimes happens is chairs talk to other chairs only within their area. And sometimes areas have long running practices and they think that that's all the tools that they have available. It was actually a conversation with Braun and other people as an experienced chair as well, being in the training and brainstorming that what has worked in other areas and what are the tools available was very useful. And in fact, we also hope that we could come up with material such as this is more focused on the consensus and the running, but even data tracker and how to make it easier for everyone to run their meetings, move the documents, having those documented somewhere and easy for us to point to would be really helpful. And let's work towards making it easier to get new working group chairs in this meeting as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, uh, Pete's comment reminded me that uh, really these trainings, developing the curriculum for these trainings would not have been possible without uh, the guidance and advice um, from a lot of folks, including Pete and uh, Jim Fenton, and I'm forgetting some of the names, Barry Leva. Um, so I really, uh, this is um, material that was developed by people from the community. This isn't, uh, you know, an outside consultant coming in and uh, they're really just uh, wrapping things together to help it uh, be easier to get to because there's a lot of um, wisdom that's captured within the community that um, is hard to access if you're if you're a new chair. So, um, Spencer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted I just wanted to say uh, thank you for opening this up to uh, chair curious folks. Um, long, long time ago, um, we did the IETF did chair training on Monday at lunch of the first IETF meeting when you were chair, which is about as long as you can wait to do chair training. Um, and we opened that up when we were still doing, uh, we, we opened that up to training for working group chairs and for document editor training on Sunday afternoons. So what you're doing now is very consistent with what we, you know, that the direction we took then, and uh, I, I really applaud it. Uh, the only, so after saying thank you, I did want to also say uh, it would be, it could be helpful for chairs to uh, take a look at people in their working groups who they think would be a good chair someplace at some point and make sure that those folks know about uh, know about chair training. I think, you know, my experience was in both directions was that having chairs and having area directors uh, 
pitch you uh, to become more involved was much better than uh, and much more likely to get a, you know, a positive response uh, for participation than just say, you know, they're just saying, you know, there's this training and it was announced someplace. So that is definitely something that chairs and even area directors can do uh, that would that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, uh, before you go, Greg, there was a comment in the chat about new training planned because it suggests that the current one is in the past. But do you have any plan? Do you have any more live training planned? We don't have any more live training planned right now, uh, but we're uh, we are considering plans for the next coming year. Uh, we want to fully digest all the learnings that we have and impact, input that we get based on the um, training that we've delivered this year. Uh, that's how we've improved it every year, and we'd look to do that again. Um, and look at also, I mean, we realize that, um, you know, live uh, training is just one modality uh, for getting, getting what we want uh, out of it. So we'd look at other options. So people shouldn't just think about this as, oh, another set of curriculum delivered in the same way. It can be, there can be other options that uh, are, you know, maybe better for other people. Um, the one other thing, because I had originally thought that, uh, you know, we should provide links to the live training, and then I noticed it's in the, the big green box at the top of the chairs.ietf.org. So at the top, there's a big green box, and it talks about training, and it has all the previous years. So uh, if you haven't done the training, I'd suggest you go look at it, uh, and, and perhaps if you're pointing it to other people, that would be helpful. Also, if there's topics that you think are missing, that would be helpful. Yeah, plug for chairs.ietf.org. Yeah, good. Yeah. It, this is your resource. So. The big green box at the top. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, I think that's it, unless there are questions. Um, the only thing I'll say is that um, uh, I, I, I see very much this kind of training. It's, it's hard to fit in, in uh, with the other priorities, but it's very much a capital investment. So it pays off in the long run when you, when you uh, sort of hone your skills on these kinds of things. That's how I look at it. So, yeah, thanks so much. Okay, so as I said, uh, we only had the one agenda item this time. I have uh, spoken to a few people. I've gotten some suggested possible AOB topics, so uh, I'm not going to go through each of these, but if there's anything you would like to bring up in the open mic or AOB, please uh, proceed to the queue. Should I go pick myself? Well, you, um, well, you can go behind the gentleman who oh, did click himself. <laughs> Justin, I'm just, I'll be brief. Um, I just noticed yesterday that... Um, we have a lot of people around that do not know that do not know the history of blue sheets anymore because we haven't been doing them for so long that there are now people that have been around for a year and a half and haven't ever seen a blue sheet. So let's just be aware of that uh, when we say that what used to be the blue sheet is now on redeck. Right. There are the clipboards with the blue sheets on them just to do a nod to history. With, with, with the. Uh, 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 so the speak. Um, I, I will not dive into the full controversy of it because I don't think it's worth doing here. But I thought an important point of what happened in Gen Area, which you may want to go look at the recording of, um, is that chairs are not as aware of procedures that happen within the IASG and around document approval as they might be. And in particular, the topic came up that you should be aware of when you need to push back and how you need to push back as a chair. Um, so that if an AD has a discuss and it's goofy in your opinion or something is wrong and it's going on forever, it is part of your responsibility as chair to do some pushing back and to have that discussion with the AD and to get things unstuck. And if it comes down to it, maybe file an appeal or help your document editor or another working group member file an appeal. And we are uh, relatively chicken about doing this. And I think we really need to start having discussions among the chairs about how this works and 
what you need to do and what your responsibilities are. And they're not just to sit there and let the consensus wash over you and then pass the document off and you're done. Happy to have more of that discussion in this room. Uh, this is Barry Lieber. I'll, I'll add to what Pete said that, that really thing I've been pushing for a long time is um, using shepherds for this kind of thing. That um, we often have chairs being, work, being document shepherds, but we often have non-chairs being document shepherds. And I believe that's really the purview of the shepherd as the first line on that. Uh, keep the discussion of the document moving, keep the document from stalling, do the interfaces that are needed. And if you need to go back to the chairs and say, chairs, I need your support for something, then that's the thing to do. But um, being a shepherd isn't just doing the shepherd write up and then disappearing. Hello. Um, I have a different topic. Um, I know some uh, work groups utilize GitHub um, in their um, work. And I was wondering, um, like, I'm interested to learn more about those from people that have experience doing this with their work group? Is there, like, is there a potentially at inviting somebody that has that experience to talk to us about this and their experience of use, utilizing it up in addition to the mailing list and stuff like this, right? Um, Say it again. There is a yeah, document. Yeah, yeah, like, oh. I think Mar Martin Thompson. Yeah. Right. So if I, microphone. So there are a couple of um, experts in the area that we could ask. Uh, Mark Nottingham was one of the first to use it with HTTP and Quick. Um, there was a GitHub working group. I think Chris Woods was one of the co-chairs. Um, there's a set of tooling that Martin Thompson uses. He's kind of otherwise occupied with Lomcom this time, but um, yes, I think it makes sense that we could have someone come in and right. talk about I, I'm, it. I'm interested more in learning from their experience. Yeah. What, what worked, what didn't work, what, how, how does that work with the mailing list? Like, okay. just learn more from their experience, right? Gotcha. Continuing on uh, to the past discussion, I think maybe uh, in our chairs page, we could have a little bit more uh, chairs.itf.org, this GitHub part a little bit, because there are a few links, but they are very high level. And especially as a chairs who want to just quickly do it, sometimes it's not as easy. And that you people, I've seen people start and then give up. Oh, there is no urgent interest right now. Maybe an authors will come in and when they push us, we'll do it. Otherwise, let it be the working groups are going on fine. We have to just make it a little bit easier uh, that might help. Like I started using with not so much documents, but with our charter and which was pretty useful. So at least some progress is happening, but my working group still prefers not to do actual document work on GitHub and that's fine. Like we have to let authors do the real work. That's more important. Uh, one thing I also wanted to add where I would like to hear some opinion is what is the best way to coordinate between working groups? We know that we do it a lot and every set of working groups have their own sort of a way. Some, some people like I know the chairs have direct call. Some people have maintaining a wiki where the coordination I thought was very needed and where I'm facing the issue is uh, the same sort of protocols. Like some protocols have same requirement. You are implementing this in BGP, which is used in some places you implement it in PSA, which is used in some places requirements are almost similar. But authors tend to do it in totally different ways because the work is being developed in two different working groups. Sometimes there's a history in how you solve this in one protocol. So that overrides, but some kind of coordination between yeah, same set of requirements being implemented in different ways. Can we at least make sure that the two set of authors are looking at each other, coordinating it. We know we have history of doing things in OSPF ISS, but I don't know what was the best way to coordinate between these working groups that have been followed in the past. So any ideas would be really nice to hear. Carson. Carson Bowman. Um, I really like this format of the working group chess meeting. I can't hear you. I really like this format of the working group chess meeting. 
little pieces of tips and tricks for chairs. And I think we should cultivate this a little bit. Um, on, on the GitHub thing, just quickly, I should quickly mention there is more than one way to do it. And uh, different groups have developed different ways of using the GitHub. And maybe it would be time to get together again and, and look at these different ways and, and see whether we can learn something. So the really GitHub intensive approach that, that the HTTP uh, cluster working groups uh, have is different from how other people use GitHub. And um, so it depends on the percentage of software developers in, in your working group very much. Um, but while we are at uh, tips and tricks for working group chairs, um, I've had to endure two and a half days of uh, working group meetings already and, and people are using Meet Echo and um, yeah. So may maybe we should have uh, little tips and tricks for using Meet Echo. And my contribution for today would be um, if you're actually sharing slides, on the uh, bottom right corner, there is a nice button you can press for changing the deck. You don't have to leave your deck and start a new deck and so on. You can just change your deck by pressing on the bottom right um, uh, icon, which is uh, two pages stacked on top of each other. And then you can choose one. Why people can still see the old uh, thing and, and it's so much quicker and, and more smoothly. Thank you. Mallory. <laughs> hey, um, <clears throat> in the spirit of maybe um, some tips, but also a uh, request for tips, I, I've been meaning to, in, the re in, in my research group, because we do often have a lot of newcomers, um, rewriting our, our GitHub um, readme file. Um, but then also maybe hosting um, a session or two synchronously for folks who might be interested in um, authoring or reviewing or other just like general IETF things. Um, so, so that's a request if folks have done that or if they have tips for doing that. I think we could probably um, you know, figure that out. Um, document editing is one big, big deal uh, for folks. I know... Um, the template thing is smoother than it used to be with GitHub and Martin Thompson's template, but it's still not perfect. I remember I'm, I'm going to conjure Avery. Avery is standing next to me right now. Avery always wanted a way to export a Google Doc into an internet draft format. And I, I know that sounds silly, but actually it would be so helpful to especially some of the folks that come to my group. So, you know, I don't know that we're going to get there but it could definitely be a little bit easier. And then the, just the last thing I'll share to thank the tools team so much for this very small feature that I requested that works amazingly. When you go to a message in the archives of any mailing list, you can get a link to that direct message, we all know. You can also download the full .eml file, which is fantastic if you don't want to subscribe to an email list in order to reply in thread. So you can download the .eml, you can open it in your client. It has all the headers. It has the message. If you reply to that, then your message lands in thread without having to always be archiving the entire mailing list for something you don't closely follow. Um, so anyway, I just want to thank Robert and his team for doing that. It's really great for newcomers as well, so they don't have thousands of emails every day. Right. Um, one thing before Jim, uh, when we're talking about GitHub, um, I, I was thinking about this on Sunday when we were doing the new participants training is that we, we keep telling them that you subscribe to the mailing list and that works for a number of working groups. But a lot of times if we have a working group that heavily uses GitHub, all of the action is over in GitHub. And, and I think we still have that problem. I'm not sure what the perfect solution is to it, uh, but I think we're misleading the new participants a tiny bit for some of the new working groups. Go ahead, Jim. Thanks, Jim Fenton. Um, Good lead into what I was going to say, because uh, um, one of the working groups that I co-chair, this is really the first one that I've co-chaired that has had a lot going on in, in GitHub. And we've had a number of people that aren't normal IETF participants, um, aren't, aren't usual IETF participants that have been participating on GitHub. I've, I've had a number of concerns about that. One is... Uh, making sure that they understand the uh, note well rules and things like that. Um, but uh, the, the bigger issues are things like um, how do we avoid having the conversation fragment between the mailing list 
and the GitHub issues. Um, you know, we've, I, I kind of resorted to kind of posting in both places, hey, look at the other place. Um, but we're also, um, you know, I don't know how much concern we have about having uh, a living record uh, or a, uh, an after the fact record of uh, what happened in the working group on our, in our mailing list archives. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned that, that uh, having a lot of the interaction, the substantive interaction, not just the editorial things, happen in GitHub causes us to lose some of that history if we need to go back and look at it later. So, so basically I'm looking for, for guidance about uh, uh, how uh, uh, working group chairs should uh, coach the uh, working group on use of GitHub in that, in that respect. One, one thing that I've seen used is, I mean, for some groups that are like all in, then they just do everything and, and the mailing lists are just for confirmation or formal announcements, right? Not for everybody, certainly. Um, sometimes it's divided by document. So some documents do a lot of their githubbery, as Stephen likes to call it, on, uh, you know, and others are all on the mailing list. There are tools um, to gateway, do weekly summaries of GitHub traffic into the mailing list, and that can be useful. Um, Mark Nottingham has the tool, but if you ask on W chairs, people will point to the link. Uh, and I forgot the other thing I was going to say. Oh, I know. The, the, when we, the IETF, if you register your GitHub repository on, in the data tracker for your GitHub group, um, when we make archive copies, we also pull down all of the pull requests and comments and feedback and issues. So at least it's available there. Not necessarily the best way to get it, but it's there. Well, at, least, at least we have a way of getting to the history. So that's, that's good. Thank you. Jay. Thanks. Um, Jay Daly, uh, ITF Executive Director. Um, yeah, I am. Trust me. Um, so uh, just coming back to um, Mallory's point about people being able to um, author uh, internet drafts through using Google Docs or something. Um, in, the, in, the broader, um, uh, in the broader case of authoring here, I think we're, we're well aware that it requires, um, from the, the broader tool strategy point of view, I, I mean, well aware that it requires a degree of um, personal technical expertise to be able to author an internet draft at the moment that um, is something some parts of the community have, but is not uh, actually a necessary attribute to participate within the community. And so that is a problem that needs to be resolved in many ways. Um, so there are um, uh, uh, thoughts and considerations and planning ahead as to how that might be, uh, you know, a, some form of simplified tool or something else might be able to be provided that would take away that pain so that um, the, uh, the overall friction of the process of, of you know, actually uh, manually creating a draft is significantly reduced. So um, nothing yet to show or demonstrate, but that is certainly part of the um, uh, strategy for the tools team coming up. Uh, this is Daniel Con gilmore um, So I wanted to respond to what are some things that chairs can do to facilitate uh, the use of GitHub. And when people say GitHub, I want to point out that you know, there are working groups that are using GitLab. Uh, the IETF could run its own GitLab instance if we wanted to, which would give you sort of native access to all of the... Um, I recognize that that would be a big lift for the tool team. I'm not asking folks to do that right now, but my point is <clears throat> these comments are uh, not just about GitHub, but about any web-based Git-backed uh, issue tracking system. Uh, so the advantage of using something like GitHub or GitLab is that people who are developers who are used to using uh, standard, modern, distributed revision control systems with issue trackers. I, I don't know how much closer I can get. That's, <laughs> um, that's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you want implementers in your working group to be able to interact with you, this is their native format. And so it's important to make sure that, you know, this is a way to facilitate implementers being active. And I don't know if your working group, maybe if your working group has no implementers, maybe that's, maybe that's a, a, a separate issue. But moving, moving stuff to a development platform, which is where implementers are used to working, uh, is an advantage. The second thing that you can do as a chair 
is you can model good behavior on the issue tracker uh, and, on the, and in Git. So for, exa for example, if you're proposing a change, which you can do as a chair, you can propose it with very clear uh, commit messages. You can ensure that when a commit gets merged, that there's a follow-up message sent to the mailing list that says, here's a summary of what we think we did. Here's a pointer to the issue uh, or th where it was discussed if it was, not, if it was only discussed on the web platform. But you can do all of those things. And even if you're not part of the discussion, you can, you can still follow up. When, when you notice people aren't doing it, you can follow up and do that, right? That's the facilitation role that the chair has. So I, I, I do encourage you to, to do that sort of thing. It, the result is actually, you know, Jim, you mentioned that you're concerned that we weren't going to keep an archive of the discussions. The result is actually a much more heavily documented discussion than the classic, well, we'll send an email every now and then with a new version of the draft. You can get, you know, change by change uh, descriptions of why specific things happen, why certain sentences were modified. Hank. So I just have to shout and not eat the mic. I know, sorry. Um, <laughs> so with my experience, um, I, I mix all the GitHub notifications and my uh, ITF email lists manually with my own Zeefs and, and mail filters. So because uh, ITF lists sometimes are conversations and when I follow drafts as a chair or as a contributor with other things, um, I get all the notifications. So what I personally do is I mix those into two folders. One of them is the original email list and one is a subfolder that is all the GitHub conversation. And so I can see what's happening in that working group. And then there's this, and someone said there's this weekly digest that helps as an overview to the list itself. That's nice. But I think um, personally, actually, um, when we want to have this documentation of activity on ID work, for example, um, archiving GitHub notification on the ID in a, I don't know, sub list that is associated. But I'm doing that. That might not be the best idea. Maybe there are better ideas, but this is how I keep track of all the things. And I can see like in the middle of the night who's working. And that's great because then I guess no. <laughs> or something like that. I don't know. So, um, so yeah, that's my only comment that I, I'm mixing both email list types. One of them is literally just GitHub and one of them is the, the manual stuff. And I will not do a GitHub click and then write that again on the list. I'm way too lazy for that or too tired or both. I don't know. Spencer. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I just I just wanted to agree with what uh, Hink, Hink was just saying, but uh, just to go just to push it a little harder. The uh, working group activities report, weekly report, uh, that uh, basically, if you go to a working group and see on their mailing list a thing that comes out usually on Sunday and says. Uh, these are the new issues that have been created. These are the comment, you know, this, these are the comments. Uh, these, you know, these are the do pull requests, uh, the, the comments on them and the pull requests and issues that are closed. Uh, if, if, if you're not sending that to your working group mailing list, then people who say, uh, but this, this conversation wasn't visible on the mailing list, they kind of have a point and we keep saying that work happens on the mailing list. But if, if you're send if you're sending that activity report uh, weekly to the mailing list, uh, it makes it, it makes it a lot easier for you to say uh, the working group did know about this when, uh, you know, when somebody says, why did this happen and how did this happen and what was the reasoning behind it and things like that. Uh, I don't see a lot of conversations that de are derailing working groups these days uh, like that, but, you know, you see some uh, where they're, you know, challenging a long conversation that wasn't reflected to the mailing list. Uh, and if, but if you send the activity report, uh, that's a, that's a really uh, trivial way to have a response to that. Uh, 
and something I something I I try to if I if I start participating in a working group or there's a new working group and the chairs are not familiar with that, uh, a lot of the times I've I've set that up for people uh, just to uh, you know just to to make that happen. Thank you. Thanks, Nasia. Hello, is this close enough? Yes. Uh, going uh, also on the GitHub issue, uh, we are analyzing data from W3C, which has uh, pretty much replaced mailings with uh, GitHub. So I'm wondering whether there are lessons learned that could be taken from there. We are analyzing the data, so maybe we have some interesting insights for the next IDF. Okay. Jonathan? Jonathan uh, Lennox. Um, I was just curious, you said that the GitHub issues and everything were being archived somewhere. Where are those archives and are they publicly visible? Yeah, there's a branch. Well, the archive tool creates a branch that pulls down JSON format of all of the issues and discussions and stuff. I don't recall the details, mm -hmm. but uh, Robert probably knows. And <laughs> So Robert Sparks, some repos have been configured with a this action that creates a backup inside the repo of all of the ancillary things like issues and discussions so that you have a copy of them if you just clone the repo. Not all working group repos have this action. If the repo is registered to the data tracker. We also intend, it's not currently working correctly, but intend to have something that keeps its own synchronized copy of not just the, the get part of the um, repository at GitHub, but all of the, uh, the ancillary things in a um, store that's available to the IETF should it need to be um, recovered. Those aren't exposed publicly. They're just back office backup kind of um, structures. So that should be working again reliably soon. It's currently not, but it is the, it's the plan for having um, a comprehensive backup. All right, Robert, before you walk away, I mean, you might not be the right person for this question, but uh, is there any sort of a plan to move to a more standardized use of GitHub or we, you know, we, we've already said different working groups use it differently. Um, I, I heard chuckles, so I guess the answer to that is no. <laughs> and no, I'm not the right person to ask the question. <laughs> but we, we're not aware of one at this stage. All right, so with that, since there's nobody in the queue, we will uh, wrap up. Uh, uh, three things on my list of closing remarks. First of all, the Secretariat ha has asked me to remind you all to please, please, please double check your um, conflicts when you're scheduling your meetings. Scheduling still uh, remains difficult, uh, so uh, please take a look at them and don't just import them from the last time. Um, second of all, um, Thank you all for being working group chairs. It's a tough job. And uh, also thank your ADs because it's also a tough job. This is part of my mission to make us a nicer IETF. And now there's somebody in the queue, so I will stop. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Just, just, uh, did you want to go? Yeah. Uh, just before folks take off, since we have a few minutes, I'd be curious, just raise a hand to get a sense. How many people here in the room are subscribed to working group chairs? And that's yeah, that's the second question. How many how many people actually read the list messages on a regular? Okay, thank you. That's super useful. I, we're just trying to figure. I was trying to figure out how effective that might be and whether we need to think about things. Thank you. Just a reminder for everyone to go give feedback to Nomcom. Oh yes, yay. Um, no. Since we are doing reminders, uh, on Friday we have a side meeting on EODIR stuff. So if education and outreach is important to you, come join us at 8.30 on Friday. Yes. Um, and with that, please take your garbage with you. That's my favorite reminder. <laughs>
So sorry. <laughs> Please take your lunch garbage with you as you depart and leave the room clean for the next meeting. Yeah. Pete, leave Tiro alone. <laughs> Wenn wir eine Variante von irgendwas machen, die nicht so oft gebraucht wird, ist 1000 drauf an dir. Ja. 